Good evening, everyone. Hello, welcome. Um, I'm Tristan Stevenson, co-founder of WhiskeyMe.com, and we're here for another one of our lockdown live whiskey tastings, which aren't just for lockdown. We're going to keep on doing them. Don't worry. Um, hopefully, you are a Whiskey Me subscriber, and hopefully, you have received your two, not one, but two pouches this month. Yes, we are spoiling you. Um, and you're ready for a really cool tasting. Um, I'm going to be joined shortly by Billy Sinclair from the Bernard Distillery, um, live from the Bernard Harbin Distillery, um, which is really, really cool. It's wonderful to have someone from the distillery talking us through these whiskies uh, as we taste them in the comfort of our own homes. Um, but before we bring in Billy, a couple of housekeeping items. Um, number one is it's Father's Day very soon, and we are offering a special deal on the Whiskey Me website for Father's Day. Um, if you use the code WhiskeyMe10, capital letters, you get 10% off. And in addition to that, Father's Day only, we are going to give you an extra free bonus pouch in gift packaging, which can be personalized as well. So you've got something to hand to your dad on Father's Day. The cutoff for ordering these is midnight tonight because obviously Father's Day is, Father's Day is approaching very quickly. Um, Second piece of housekeeping, some of you have noticed already, uh, is that we have hit one of our subscriber landmark targets. Uh, we surpassed 1,750 subscribers earlier in the month of June. And that means that we're going to send everyone a free Glencairn glass, a tasting glass, a whiskey tasting glass. Um, if you don't have a Glencairn, then um, you will soon. Um, they're fantastic uh, glasses, shaped a bit like this, um, except they don't have a stem. They have a sort of solid bottom. Um, but the, the the bowl of the glass is more or less exactly the same as this kind of tasting glass. And across the industry, these are considered to be the best glasses for nosing and tasting and appreciating whiskey. Ours are going to be branded with Whiskey Me. Um, they are going to be free. Um, we're going to be sending out an email very soon detailing exactly how we're going to get these to you. Um, Broadly speaking, it's going to involve a code which you're going to enter on our website to claim your free glass and then we'll get it shipped out to you. Um, be warned, though, it is going to take a few weeks to get them to you. Um, we're also going to have a cutoff date for the free glass ordering because we're going to order everything at once from Glencairn and send them out to you in one big batch. So uh, keep an eye on your emails and you will get that coming to you very soon. Right. On with the tasting. Um, Vunahab. Very exciting. Two whiskies to get through. Um, I'm going to now bring in Billy Sinclair from the distillery. Now, Billy, how are you doing? How you doing? Good. Good to have you on board. Thanks very much for inviting me. Yeah, and we can see you're actually at the distillery there because presumably you don't have a presentation of whiskies like that on your shelf at home. Not quite so good at home, but yeah, <laughs> I'm at home, but this, this is the, the real deal here. So yeah, we're at the, the new visitor centre at the moment. How new is the new visitor centre? Um, brand new, actually, uh, as yet, unfortunately, unopened, given the current circumstances. Um, so it's a complete new build. If anyone's been to Bonahaven before, it's a, it's a world of difference. Um, we like to reward you when you make it down that long, winding road to Bonahaven. Now you'll be able to relax and enjoy a dram and comfort when you finally get here. Yeah, I, I visited Bonahaven last time about five or six years ago, I think. And... It, it 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 was a distillery that felt like it needed a little bit of love for a visitor's centre and that kind of thing at the time. It's it's loaded with character. It's it's, <laughs> it's 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 intrinsically true in terms of being a distillery. It's still it's still an artisanal type distillery. It's a working distillery. It's making good spirit. Um, and the visitor side of that has grown exponentially over the last few years. And like all these things, it takes us a little bit of time to catch up and and actually get to a level where we want to be playing at in, in all aspects of what we do. The whiskey's already there. Now we're, we're, we're getting into to that position with the, the visitor experience as well. Right. So um, tell us a little bit about what's been going on at the distillery during the last sort of two or three months. How has the lockdown affected production and that kind of thing? Uh, production has been stopped for, for some time. It started up again last week. Um, all the distilleries in Isla have been closed for a number of weeks now. So over the last two, three weeks, things have started to, to engage again in terms of production. All the visitor centres are still closed. Um, we don't know what situation we'll be in in the next coming weeks with, with that. Um, 
Sorry, I'm just looking there. I've seen uh, certain Mr. Woodcock has commented on my lockdown haircut. Um, thank you, Stephen. It's nice to be appreciated. Uh, <laughs> no doubt many of us have got lockdown haircut. I'm, I'm not unique in that sense. Well, I've just got a lockdown, like no haircut. I've just, it's just left to grow out, basically. Yeah, but if mine goes out, I look like a lighthouse, so it's just not worth it. <laughs> um tell us a little bit about yourself how did you because you're the distillery visitor center manager how did you get that role and what's your background in the industry i know that you haven't been whiskey industry your entire career no um when we moved over to isla uh seven years ago i, I started as a, a summer tour guide at like distillery and then i got a permanent job as a, a, a lead guide at kalila and then just over two years ago, I moved around the, around the bay a little bit further <laughs> to, to Bonahaven. So in that sense, I've been really fortunate in that not only have I converted my hobby into my job, but I've worked at three of my favourite distilleries. So I'm, I'm one of those lucky guys that everybody hates. Yeah, right. Uh, that, how, so Lagavulin to Kalila to Bonahaven. So you're sort of making your way up the coast there kind of thing. To the island and roundabout, yeah. I, I can't go any further or else I fall off the island. You can round to kill Homan. <laughs> um, so, and and before you worked, you said it was your hobby. Before you worked in the distillery, you, your background is as a biologist, right? I worked in the the uni system for twenty five years or so. Um, I was a geneticist and a biochemist, and I worked in agricultural systems, forestry. Spent six years in Australia, so became a marine biologist because that was way cooler. Um, did a lot of different different things around genetics and biochemistry and then decided it was time for a change. But I've been drinking whiskey for, my wife says I've been drinking whiskey for way too long and way too often. Um, and I managed to massage that That's around familiar. so I ended up doing it as a job. <laughs> but so, but you don't, so you're not putting any of your like biochemistry background to use at the distillery as such since you're running the visitor centre or do you occasionally like go into the like fermenting room and comment on the state of the washbacks? Oh God, no. Um, Andrew, <laughs> um, no, what, what it does do is that it means that I can hold my own in most arguments with some of the, the, the guests that we get on Isla, uh, especially we get a lot of whiskey uh, aficionados on Isla that, that know the system inside out and have very strong particular views on different aspects of producing whiskey and matur maturing whiskey. So I, I get into some great discussions with them. It's great. Nothing like that really phases me. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good stuff. <laughs> I because I, I there's a strange dynamic isn't there between sort of whiskey geeks I think in some ways they they occasionally know more about certain elements of the distillery than the distillers themselves and yet they have no practical knowledge of actually how to make whiskey they don't have work today in the distillery you know that that's fairly commonplace I mean most distilleries these days that they're not as most of them are not as big an employer as they used to be 50 100 years ago because there's a lot more um, mechanized processes. We, there's a lot of things come in by truck that used to be lifted off of boats. So it's a, it's a much smaller um, family group of people that are working in the distillery itself. And the amount of the explosion in, in whiskey fans and the explosion in whiskey per se over the last 10, 15 years is astronomical. And there's just not enough room for all those people to have that experience of working in the distilleries. So that's, that's where all this intrinsic knowledge comes from, that people are reading about it, they're talking about it, they're going visiting distilleries, and they're picking up all this information. And there's some, the, the whole diaspora has changed in terms of people that drink whiskey now. I mean, when I was young, it was something that the old guys drank at the back of the pub and no one really spoke about. I mean, I'm a bit of a dinosaur, I know. But now it's it's it's, it's a, a common thing to be to be involved in. People talk about it all the time. It's advertised so yeah. much more widely. It's, it's hugely different now than it used to be. Mm. So you've worked at three of the distilleries in Isla, um, yeah. which gives you, I mean, Isla's a pretty small place anyway, but that gives you a pretty good position to sort of comment on where you feel um, Buna Harbin sits amongst that Isla set, because each distillery on Isla is subtly different, although obviously peatiness is something that's associated with Isla, and of course Buna is a bit of an exception in that respect. So where where does it sit? What makes it different to the Lagavulins, the Bowmores, the Brookladdies, etc.? I'm wearing the Buna Haven, the Buna Haven shirt, so I've got to say it sits right at the top, haven't I? <laughs> um, it sits well within the, the Isla family of whiskies. I mean, we, we've got a pedigree and a history. We are a, a, a definitive Isla distillery. We, we make whiskey in the Isla way. And up until the, the mid-60s, we were producing heavily peated Isla-style 
like Pete Monster Whiskey, the same as Lefroy, Lagavulin, Arbeg, all, all the, the ones that are widely known for that power. Um, and we changed tack completely at that point and moved over to be wholly producing unpeated whiskey to, to, to supply certain markets. It was a market driven change. Um, so in that sense, we are unique in that about 80% of what we make every year is unpeated. Other distilleries will make a small batch of, of unpeated whiskey, but they're predominantly peated. So we've got a very distinctive profile on, on Isla, um, but we still have that distinct Isla heritage that makes us part of this beautiful island and, and the history that goes with it. Yeah, fantastic. There's a couple of people asking what your dream drams are. Ah. <laughs> um, I've always said that Bonner Haven 18 is one of my favourite whiskies ever. It's just, it, it ticks so many different boxes. But I've, I've got very eclectic taste. I mean, I like Mortlach, I like Crag and Moore. You can't beat a lag of own distillers edition. So it's like everybody, mm. they've, they've all got individual palettes that determine whether you like or you don't like something. And I've, we, we do have a laugh when people say they come into the distillery and they say, oh, I don't, I don't like whiskey. I'm only here with, with her because she, she drinks whiskey. And basically, there's, there's enough different expressions out there now that you just haven't tried enough. You'll find one that you like eventually. Just keep going. Yeah, exactly. There's no kind of archetype spirit that tastes like whiskey. You know, it's such a diverse category of spirits now that there is something for everyone. And if, it, if there's not something in a, in a glass like this, then there's a mixed drink, you know, that will work for you. Um, so I, I, I agree with you. I, it's it's not the case there isn't something you, that uh, you like. There isn't something you like. There's just some, isn't you haven't found the thing yet, you know. Well, uh, yeah, just saw one of the comments come through. You, the forty-six year old behind me. Yeah, that would be a favourite, but you need to pay me more. <laughs> Damn, we'll try and get that in a patch at some point. <laughs> <laughs> All righty then. Um, Cool, let's uh, get on with the tasting then. So we, we've got the 12-year-old um, and yeah. the, and you might have to correct my, uh, in fact, you're definitely gonna have to connect my, correct my pronunciation here, but let's give it a go anyway. Twitik Ada. That's better than my first attempt at it. Now, I'm originally from Glasgow and I've got five native Gaelic speakers in the visitor center and they all speak a slightly different version of Gaelic. So they all pronounce <laughs> it in different ways. So I've got sort of an amalgam of the two, and for me, it's toy chicka ga. Toy chicka da, a ga, a da. All right, cool. The new one, toy chicka is too. Okay. What, so, uh, it, what does it mean in Gaelic? Gaelic, um, smoky too. We used to have an expression called toy chuk, which was smoky, mm. and this is the, the, the new iteration of that, so it's smoky too. Oh, there we go. That makes sense. It's just numbered, basically. All right, good stuff. So, so that's the smoky one. So we're going to taste the twelve first, correct? We're going to start off with the, the little pouch of the twelve-year-old. Yeah. Yep. All right. Crack into that then. And you've got pouches as well, which is uh, yep. quite funny, really, since you seem to have all the whiskey behind you. I've, I've also got a bottle of it here, so I can, I can always have a wee refill. Yeah, I've got that. Actually, I've I've got a bottle of twelve-year-old in the house. So uh, if necessary, I will go and get it. Um, if this goes on for more than two hours, then um, we'll crack into that. <laughs> All right then. Um, so what would we expect to find in the glass on this? What's the sort of defining character of this whiskey? It's, well, it, intrinsically in Isla, you're looking for peat, but because let's say we are mainly unpeated, when you nose it, you're not getting that big blast of phenols. You're not getting that, that big hit of the, the smokiness that you would expect from an Isla malt. Instead, for me, this is quite soft. It's quite fruity. There's a little bit of, for me, because of where we are right on the shoreline, most of the whiskey that we produce, you've, you've always got that intrinsic little little bit of briny salt coming through, like on mm. the aroma coming through on it. It's fruity, leathery, almost like old leather. Remember the old leather armchairs you used to get in the library? In the smoking room type thing that that sort of smell to it and very soft and delicate it's not a big abrasive powerful nose on it and it's bottled at 46.3 percent um all yeah it's a good strength that good strength it, is, it allows a lot of the the lighter flavors to still be there and the lighter aromas to still be there at a high enough level to taste them but it's not got that burn that you, you associate with a really high concentration of alcohol when you have you a were saying um Sorry, when you were saying um, leather, because I just, I don't know if it's the color as well, it's got a wonderful, almost yellow straw color, it's really, really nice, but I was 
getting a little bit of tropical fruit, just a touch of like mango. And then when you said leather, I was like, mm, it's not fresh mango. It's like when you get dried mango um, yeah. and it's almost like mango leather. So it's like tropical fruit with that sort of slightly dry, almost yeah. tobacco-y kind of um, character. It, let's see, it's, it's not full cast strength. It's 46.3%. But just on that, if you add one or two drops of water to it, for me, the tropical fruits really do open up mm. both on the nose and on the palate. For me, when you when they finish on this one, the aftertaste is quite dry. Some of that brininess comes through again. And for me, I get a little bit of licorice or star anise coming through just at the back of the throat. But I, that's, for me, that's the one thing. If I go in a taste, and I hate being told what to taste because everybody's mm. going to taste something different. And for me, when I say things like this or, or, or pick out little flavours, it's just to stimulate people to, to think maybe outside the box if they haven't thought about those sort of things. And the easy way is just to let your mind relax and empty and just take in what's in the glass. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when we talk about tasting notes, really what we're doing is suggesting a few of the things that we can smell or taste that you may or may not get. Um, and if often it might trigger something else. You go, oh, yeah, no, it's not mango. It's pineapple I can smell. Or it's not mango. It's some floral note that I can get. But I think just throwing out words is sometimes really helpful to sort of get the kind of tasting dictionary, uh, you know, in full flow. It's just opening the book and letting people access it. I mean, it's, it's funny, but you've got to be careful what you say with things like this, because I, I was doing a tasting once um, with maybe 12 people around the table, and they were nosing the whiskey, and it was a, a peated expression we were, we were doing, and they were nosing it, and one guy in particular was getting more and more frustrated. I said to him, well, what's, what's, what's wrong? Are you okay? He said, oh, I just can't get anything but smoke. These guys are pulling out all these different things. I said to him, okay, just take a, a long, slow, deep breath, close your eyes, and count to 10 and say the first thing that comes into your mind. So he did. He took a long, big, deep breath of it. He shut his eyes, and you could see the wee light bulb moment. And he went, bananas. And at that point, it's great. Someone's got over that hurdle of the smoke or the peat, and they've found a different flavour. But his mates just... The, the taste in nosedived at that point because everything was just bananas, bananas, bananas. So we ended up just sort of having a good laugh and a, a, a good half hour tasting with them. It is, it is definitely possible to fixate on a certain aroma or taste and you're like, ah, what is that? What is that? And it can actually sort of end up dominating your tasting or appreciation of that whiskey where all other aromas fall by the wayside. Um, and then even when you get it, it's all you can smell. It's quite satisfying to find, I think, as, you know, a particular fruit or spice or chocolate or whatever within a whiskey and go, ha, I know what that whiskey tastes like now. Yeah. But it's also nice to just appreciate the nuance and not necessarily like focus on having to have clear tasting notes on everything in the glass. Definitely. I mean, I, I think the, the 12, for me in particular, it's got a beautiful balance, a, a, almost a symmetry between the aromas that you get in the nose and the, the flavours you get on the palate. You, when you smell it, it's almost like it, it does what it says on the tin sort of thing. When you when you nose it, mm. and when you it, you're linking that that nose and the aromas and the scent you're picking up to what you're actually tasting in the palate, and letting the two of them marry together, and it just fills the mouth with flavour. It's a beautiful, light, drinkable whiskey. As a few people say, an apricot, and um, I definitely concur with that. In fact, I might even have to retract my initial mango statement and say that apricot is the correct tasting note. <laughs> I knew it was a dried yellow fruit, okay? Just, uh... <laughs> we haven't got to say that for yet, so it's okay. <laughs> All right, then. Um, good stuff. I mean, that's really tasty. And um, I think, um, you know, like you say, if you said to someone, you know, this is a 12 year old Isle of whiskey, they might be surprised because uh, it's not peated. Um, there's, no, there's no peated malt in there at all is that 100 percent non-peated the malt itself is unpeated yes um people mm. say when they open a bottle of the 12 year old that they get a faint wisp of smoke or a little bit of peatiness there and they think it's a, a sort of balance of of unpeated and peated malts or, or unpeated and peated casts that we, we use but effectively it's it's baseline levels of phenols that are already present in the soil so the barley picks up some and one of the things that we have uh want to have is we've got wooden washbacks so when we do peated spirit, you'll get a little bit of index into the wood of, of that, that oiliness that you would get from the phenolic mm. 
floating in the barley. When we go back onto unpeated, we'll wash the, the wash backs out, but we won't sort of jet wash them back to raw wood because that, that'll change the flavour. So you will get a little bit of leaching of, of that oiliness coming back in. Over the whole 64,000 litres in each wash back, it's, it's a minute fraction. Um, but mm. people, some people are convinced that they can get a, a smoky hint off the 12-year-old. And that, that's great. That's all part of the story and part of the fun. Yeah, totally. Would you ever um, refill casks that have contained peated spirit with unpeated? Probably not, um, because the, the the way the the phenols and the oils imp interact with the wood, it changes the, the flavour profiles that you can get from it. So any any production systems that we do here are basically either producing unpeated spirit or peated spirit that go into certain casks. I mean that we we. Diageo did that a couple of years back where they took casks from each of their different distilleries and transferred them around to other distilleries to look at the flavour mixes that you get. And it is a, a, a hugely experimental process. Um, we're doing that slightly differently in terms of we're taking peated and unpeated spirit and putting them into new styles of casks that we haven't previously used before to get that, that different flavour profile. It's, it's a bit like doing a, if you go back to your, your school days when you were in, in the lab at school, you'd do the same experiment six times and you'd only change one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. I think that's the, the simple way of doing it so that you've only got the one variable and you can analyse in more detail mm -hmm. flavour trait changes, the profile changes and what that brings to the mix rather than getting a bit too complicated with too many different things because it could easily go pear-shaped. And that well, yeah, you, you need to control some parts of the experiment, don't you? Otherwise, you don't even know how you got to where you got to, right? <laughs> oh, this tastes delicious, but what did we do to get there? <laughs> but then you have to try and reproduce it, and that's part of the problem. Exactly, yeah. Right. Um, number two. Smoky number two. Smoky number. I'm going to try and pronounce it again. Toy Shuk Agat. There you go. But you see, do it for me. This one, you'll be saying it like a native, it's fine. Yeah, exactly. I'll just drink enough of it, right? And then it comes naturally. When we come to Isla, um, we get a lot of people struggle to, in terms of how to pronounce Bonahaven. It's not the easiest word to say. I think there's ourselves and we're, we're neighbours down the road at Bricladi. They're the two hardest distilleries to, to actually pronounce properly. See, after a couple of drams, it doesn't really matter. It all rolls off the tongue very easily anyway, so it's all good. Yeah, exactly. Everyone else has had so many dramas and not listening to you anyway, right? <laughs> no, we never. <laughs> that far. People just get happy. That's all. But when you taste right. this, it's, when you know this one, this is a completely different animal. Right away, you're getting that, that smoky, phenolic nose that you would expect from what you'd class as a traditional Isla whiskey. It's, it's big, it's thick, it's heavy, it's oily. And for me, this is a, a beautiful, complex aroma because with, when you put uh, barley in through the, the peating process, phenols are quite sharp. They've got a very astringent taste and you have to balance how much phenols you've got there and the phenols that you have with the, the spirit that you actually produce. Some spirits can be easily overwhelmed by it. Others work well in tandem with high levels of phenols. And it's that balance and that getting that, that, that nice mid-level. And I think on the nose, that's what we have here. This is peated to about 40 parts per million in phenols, which is about the same as Lagavulin. But it's a very, very different animal from a Lagavulin yeah. because it's a very, very different spirit to Lagavulin. So, I mean, for me... And that's, that's down to the stills, right? Lagavulin have got those kind of dumpy stills, eh? And... It's, it's down to a, a number of different processes, but in particular the stills, the shape of the stills, the speed at which the spirit gets produced through the stills. Our line arms are, are horizontal, like a and they dip down. So you get a different mix of alcohols coming through the process into the spirit safe. And that changes the flavour and the, the character of the spirit. So like a is a lot more oily, we're a lot lighter and more floral. Yeah. Again, right, we're getting some we're getting some aroma notes coming through. Sorry to interrupt you. Oh, so right. we've got uh, I, I smell salt. Um, yes. <laughs> we've got smoked chili, uh, barbecue bacon, um, glorious paprika. We've got one guy that's a, a big Bonahaven fan in, in Canada, JC Fanouf, and he has this this fixation with bacon in Bonahaven. Every drama he tastes has got bacon, so you'll love that comment coming through that you can get bacon on the nose. But for me, this one, again, it's 46.3%, all natural colour, 
and not chill filtered. None of our whiskies are chill filtered. So you're getting all that natural oil pro uh, uh, coming through the process that gives a really good mouthfeel and coating. On the nose, you've got peatiness there. You've got the phenols, but it's also quite soft and rich. It's not aggressive or, or uh, um, powerful in the, in the nose. When you taste it, you get that lovely, rich, warm feeling in the mouth. And it dries off towards the end. Now, for me, this is, although this is a, a, new, a newer dram for us, this is a very complex dram. Because on the, on the mouth, you get that peatiness. And then you get the sweetness of the, the sherry influence and the oak of the wood coming through. But for me, whenever I taste a, a peated Bonahaven, it's always almost in two stages. The first part in the palate, you get the peatiness, that rich, earthy note, that humid, rich aroma, and you get the flavour of the whiskey. But after you swallow, when you breathe out through your nose, that's when you get the smokiness coming back. So it's, it's a way that I can distinguish very clearly between peat and smoke. And that's one of the questions I get a lot. What's the difference? Peatiness is that earthy, humid, you know, the, the, the smell you get when you open a damp greenhouse. That's of rich earthiness. And the smokiness is that ashy, dry quality that mm -hmm. comes after aftertaste with it. Yeah. I, it's really interesting on the palate. I mean, um, for me, and I guess it's partly to do with the strength of the spirit that the spirit's bottled at, there's a nice prickly heat to it that carries that smoke through. And I think for me, this one has more of those sort of saline qualities and it's a maritime kind of smoke, tarry rope, someone mentioned in the comments, and I, I agree with that. And I'm, I'm not sure I do get bacon because that is something, although there's saltiness, bacon I, I kind of feel is a sweeter um, style of smoke. And for me, this is all about dry, peppery, spice straw smoke. You know? That's exactly it for me. It's dry, it's peppery. There's For me, there, there's cinnamon at the start, but it moves through dark chocolate, through smoked fish, almost to like a, a bonfire in the beach smokiness at the end. Mm, yeah. Bright smoke coming through. And it's got a really long, rich aftertaste on, on the back end of it. It lasts there for a wee while. And uh, the really cool. that, that comes a little bit, I suppose, from the fact that it's a non-age statement whiskey. So some of it's a bit younger, some of it's a bit older. But it gives that lovely balance of flavours, again, that we were talking about of mellow, smooth, complex, and young and fiery and peppery and spicy and active. And marrying them together gives that whole mouthfeel. Very good. Um, a few questions coming through. Um, no age no age statement on this one. Can you give us a rough idea of what how old the spirit in the bottle is? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, there's no age statement. Yes, you're right. There's no age statement. Age, age is a, a bit of a, a misleading characteristic. I mean, these are what we call flavor-led, non-age statement flavor-led. It's all about the taste. It's all about the flavor. And I mean, imagine yourself and, and so many of the guys out there. I've tried some really good whiskies that are three, four years old. Totally different from a really good whiskey of 18, 20 years old. If you go into it expecting it to be old and soft and it's young and fiery, you're not going to like it. And it's, for me, it's about opening your mind. It's about opening your, your palate to try different things. And that's one of the things that this is about. It's about expressing the spirit in all its different forms. Because this is a very different animal from the 12 or the 18-year-old. Um, it's about, this is part of the character of Bonahaven. It's part of the character of Bonahaven mixed with peat. But just let it wash over you and don't get hung up on age. I'm at the age now where I don't talk about age too much. So it's, yeah, it's young, it's spicy, it's great, go for it. <laughs> No, I'm with you on it. Um, you know, it's, I mean, it's partly the fault of the whiskey industry itself, you know, going back a few decades, getting us sort of fixated on age and older is better. Um, when in fact, tasty is better. And, um, you know, we shouldn't spend too much time getting hung up on it. So the answer to the question is, it's at least three years old. Um, <laughs> it's over three years, don't worry. Don't worry. It's, it's at least three years in a day, don't worry. <laughs> um oh uh daryl asked um which we did already cover about when the decision was made at bonaharban to go unpeated that was the 60s right yeah 63 60 thereabouts yeah and that was just due to market demand basically mainly to supply unpeated spirit for cutty sark which was a blend um which was yeah. really you know so we, we, we changed over to supply that amongst other other issues that well that wasn't the only decision maker but there was a, a range of different things that did that yeah okie dokie any more questions do 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 i think so but everyone's loving it 
I just got a comment coming through there about the, the non-edge statement for the guy that buys four-year-old Octomores. <laughs> it's all about <laughs> marketing. Yeah, there you go. Uh, just, it, it, it doesn't it, either the either the age needs to be high or the uh, phenolic parts per million needs to be high. It has to have that quality that makes it stand out from everything else. And I think for me, this this is it, it's almost like bona having going back in time. This this is a, a traditional Isla Isla whiskey. It's big, it's yeah. bold, it's, it's a peat monster, and it's got loads of character. And in a way, that's that lets us re enhance our credentials. Yeah, we're an Isla distillery. We can we can play with the big PT boys if we want to. We like doing this, but we can also hold our own when it comes to this. And that's that's what it's about. You've got to adapt and evolve as a distillery within the the, the current market and, and still be relevant. Yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, I think I it's, I think it's really a great privilege to be able to taste two whiskies from the same distillery, one of them unpeated and the other, um, you know, pretty heavily peated. Um, similar price point as well. There's not that much in them, right? And yeah. um, the the. Forty-four pounds, forty-six pounds thereabouts in the distillery shop here, but there, there's lots of bargains out there if you go hunting. So, for a good solid Isla malt whiskey, that that's not a bad, bad place to start. Right. Yeah, and of course you can buy it at whiskeyme.com if you want to, if you like it, you want to get a whole bottle. The moment, so go there. <laughs> All right. Um, I think everyone's still firing in tasting notes. We'll just let them do that. Um, and we'll, we'll go and uh, enjoy a dram by ourselves. Thank you so much for joining no us, Billy. It's an absolute pleasure having you. No problem, Tristan. Anytime. You know that. You're more than welcome. We can yeah. over and see when we can get moving again and we'll, we'll give you another dram or two. Definitely. We'll, we'll, we'll be up in due course for sure. Yeah. Thanks ever so much. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, and we will see you next month for uh, the next Whiskey Me Live tasting. Cheers, guys. Good night. Cheers, guys. Bye. Thank you.